Right. Hey, uh, new stream here. Hey, welcome everybody. So, uh, boy, what a day, huh? And, uh, no idea what happened on the other one, but you know, the beauty of technology is sometimes you just don't know why certain things happen. And, uh, then you, uh, you fix it. And, uh, we're going to have everybody join in this link now for, for the one that we would do in the evening here anyway. So, um, Geo says, you have POCD, pedophilic OCD. You're a social worker working with children. You often deal with CPS. And uh, and let's see. CPS cases related to abuse. Ideas on continuing your work with these children, ERP, et cetera, without having POCD interview. Thank you. You know, Gio, one of the things that we, we know with pedophilic OCD concerns is that uh, um, we, we see a lot of people and and I'm not making this up. I've worked with a lot of people who work with children who have this. And and usually it's because the passion people have for working with children, that's what OCD then is going to jump in on and say, oh, wait, you work with children. Well, what if you were to harm the children? And for you, because you're already working with people who have been harmed, what if you become another harm to the children who have already been harmed? Wouldn't that be awful? Wouldn't that be whole, uh, just horrible? So you should stay away with them. So Gio, I'm going to encourage you to really work with a therapist on this who can really assist you through that and get you to be able to recognize that you don't need to spend any time listening to that dumb OCD uh, throughout the day because it is not there to help you and it is not there to make anything better whatsoever. So, Riley says, how do I stop feeling the urge to redo your checking behaviors? It never feels right. Well, Riley, I think you just answered your own question there. It's not supposed to feel right. Okay. Recognize that, Riley. It is not supposed to feel right. And I know, I know that that feels weird and awful and horrible and everything. But guess what? It is not supposed to feel right because things feel right are in the realm of obsessive compulsive disorder. Right. For something to feel just right means that it has satisfied the needs of the OCD. We are not here to satisfy the needs of the OCD. That is not why we are here. We are here to undo the influence of that OCD. That's what's going on. Oh, gee, what are you following me? My gosh, well, and every everywhere I go, you just there. You there you are. How are you? I may or may not be stalking you. <laughs> I'll have to live with the uncertainty and doubt about that. Me Tracy, too. hi. Uh, sorry Hello. about that. A uh, little technical glitch there that ended the stream somehow, but we're all good. We're back up and live again, so it's awesome. We'll get our crowd back, and I know they're putting out messaging for everyone now to come on over to this link, and that is awesome. So, Tracy, Hello. you are going to be spending some time right now talking more specifically about child and adolescent experiences in the OCD world as well too, aren't you? I am. I'm, mm -hmm. I am going to be talking about the fact that we see people here at NoCD, children as young as five, all the way up to whatever you consider no longer a kid. I mm -hmm. consider it somewhere in your 30s, but that's okay. Well, we know this, the brain's still developing until around age 26. <laughs> so definitely at least into that area, you might be considered a kid. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So. Awesome. Yeah. Tracy, I'm going to hand it over to you for a little bit and uh, get a stretch of the legs in if that's all right. And then I will come back in a bit and join you again. <clears throat> I think I could probably allow that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, yes, as Dr. McGrath said, hello. Welcome back. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulties there for a minute. So we are talking today about child and adolescence. 
um, OCD and the different ways that we might see OCD presented in children and adolescents and also how that might differ from adults and maybe some tips for parents and loved ones and caregivers um, who take care of children and adolescents. So if you have any questions about child, child adolescence or parenting uh, with OCD, feel free to ask. In the meantime, I will talk a little bit about how OCD shows up in very young children and I think a lot of people um, who I've talked to think that if you don't have OCD as a child, that, that you know, it, you're not going to get it later on. Or it's not OCD if it didn't happen as a child and it just happened to you as an adult. That is not true. OCD can happen whenever it happens. Some people do get it in childhood. Some people don't notice it. Um, I see a question, what are the signs in toddlers? Um, well, there are all kinds of things. Um, and I think that this is a good, a good way, uh, a, good, a good segue into this conversation. So let's talk about what are signs and symptoms uh, that maybe you have a, a, a young one who might be struggling with OCD or anxiety uh, related disorders. So when you are small, especially very, very young, we don't have words or descriptions for how we're feeling, right? You can't say, wow, I woke up with a great level of anxiety in my chest and you know, now I don't know what to do with it. So I'm, I, may, I may misbehave today. I may be more on edge. I might, right? You don't, you don't have those words. So kids tend to do more things with behaviors, tend to watch for behaviors. When you are preschool aged, when you haven't gone to school yet, it's a little bit harder. And I tell parents, the best way for you to know is to go and get assessed by a professional because parents tend to read way too much into what is happening with their kids. Why? Because we love them and we want them to be okay. So I've certainly had people come in and say, oh my gosh, this, my kid, you know, does this thing over and over. They want me to read the same book a hundred times a day. I think they have OCD. I say, no, they have being a child syndrome. Um, I had to read the same books over and over and over. That's because kids actually have um, the ability to learn by doing things over and over. And sometimes they just get stuck on a particular thing. You know, maybe your kid loves trains and they obsess about trains. That doesn't necessarily mean they have OCD. So where we start to look for OCD is where things are causing distress, right? The love of hearing the same book every day a hundred times isn't necessarily OCD. But if I say, um, I need you to read me this book, and you say, I, I, I can't read this book right now, and you know, oh my gosh, you know, and the kid's flipping out and having a whole tantrum and, 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 and you can't figure out why it's so distressing to the kid and you, it, things like that, right? So looking at behaviors where there's not a, a, a tolerate, it looks, just looks like they're not able to tolerate certain things. So um, it's, it's a little bit harder, I think, for parents to really to recognize the, and be able to tell the difference between a normal, if you will, or a non-OCD, say toddler versus another person. A lot of OCD happens in your head. So you can't always see OCD. I certainly had OCD uh, when I was five. I don't remember um, too much before that that I can remember if it was OCD or not. I might have had it, couldn't tell you. Um, but I can tell you at five that nobody knew that I had OCD. Nobody could have said, oh, let's look at Tracy. Yep, I know she has OCD because she does this thing over and over or she doesn't do a thing or she avoids doors or something. That, they wouldn't have thought that uh, because it was all happening in my head. So a lot of OCD happens in the form of mental rituals, um, small little things that kids do. So you won't always recognize it. Sometimes you will. Sometimes it becomes more distressing for the child. But things you can look out for, um, things taking longer than they should. And maybe you observe and you notice your kid has to do stuff in a certain way. They only put on their clothes in a certain way. Maybe they 
I worked with a very small child. Um, this is a, a good example. The youngest people I've treated with OCD were three. Um, we don't treat three-year-olds, mm -hmm. uh, but we do treat mm -hmm. five-year-olds at uh, NISDD. And, um, and it was something about needing to have things in a certain order, in a certain way. And uh, what would happen is if this person, this little kid would put their crayons and their markers and their other things in a certain order, they had all their toys in a certain order. And if anybody disrupted that order, that kid lost it. That kid was off, off on a tangent, just off, temper tantrums, all the stuff. And they thought, gosh, why is this kid acting like this? Every time somebody, you know, you take one color out and you move the marker to a different section and this kid would lose it. You know, that's, that's a good indication that something's not quite right, right? Most kids aren't going to really care if you have things in an exact order every single time. So that is a really good um, example of maybe an area where you go, well, that's a little different than most people. Again, it's, it really requires you to go in and have an evaluation. Um, a lot of that is observing by a professional and making sure that they can tell you the difference because kids who are small are weird, right? They're weird, they're figuring out the world. They don't have words. They don't know how to express themselves. So um, yeah, so there's that. Um, let's see, let's see, uh, my five-year-old can't eat pizza by herself. She gets anxiety when the pizza sauce touches her hands, fingers, lips. So I have to feed her myself. Ooh, I love that. You just brought me right into a conversation about accommodations. So saying your five-year-old cannot eat pizza by herself because she gets anxiety when the pizza sauce is touching her in various places, right? So that's a good indication that there's something going on. Is it OCD? I don't know. Maybe it's a sensory issue. I don't know what it is. That's why you have to go in and get evaluated. But um, that is the kind of thing like with contamination or maybe uh, just right OCD where, you know, my fingers have to feel a certain way or I can't get sauce over here, but not here. I don't like the feeling or uh, of this. And so uh, accommodations are when we do things for the kids um, to help them get by these difficult moments. So um, like feeding your child pizza because they don't like how it feels on their hands and face would be considered an accommodation, right? The reason is there's nothing dangerous about pizza or having sauce on your fingers and your hands, right? And so if you start with that, if you start feeding your child pizza because they don't like how it feels, that's just the very beginning of a long road that you go down where you will be doing several things to make your child's OCD, if it is indeed OCD, feel more comfortable. And the more comfortable it feels, the more it moves right in and the more it's going to demand of you. I've worked with people who's, who have gotten to the point where they have to wake up every morning several hours before they go to work so that they can do a deep clean of every area the child is going to walk on from the time they wake up until they get out the door to school. Um, that is an example of what happens when we accommodate uh, too long, too much, and, and kind of where it can lead us. And that is a really good reason to get kids into treatment early. We are able to show that with children and adolescents, it is very effective to get them into treatment early, especially for OCD. And the reason is, we think about learned behaviors. We think about, think about like, a, I don't know how old you are, maybe you had vinyl records like me, or maybe you have CDs or something else. But you know, they've got the little grooves that go in it. So the more that we do a particular behavior, the more ingrained it becomes in us and the more, the easier we fall into that behavior over and over and over. So having OCD for 80 years, obviously, you're, you're going to have a little bit deeper of a groove than if you've had it for a year or six months or a couple of years. And so we find treating children and adolescents to actually be very successful and um, really, to me, it's my favorite population to work with because you just see change and you you 
save a kid or a teenager from having to do this forever um, until they become adults and, and are able to get uh, the treatment that they need. Um, other kinds of things to look out for <clears throat> as kids start to get older, um, they might be asking you to do things, asking for special things. I don't want to eat at the dinner table with the family. I want to eat by myself in my room. I just feel like it's just the cleaner for me. Or we hear a lot of, I can't be around my sibling. My sibling is dirty. My sibling, you know, contaminates an area. I don't like to be around them. Um, we also see it in forms like, um, asking parents or loved ones to repeat certain sentences or do things in a certain way. Um, a common one would be um, like how I need you to say good night. I love you. See you in the morning. Um, that was one of mine when I was a kid, by the way. Um, I wanted all three of those things because for me, that was a guarantee. Good night. Okay. So we're closing down. I love you. Okay, good. We guaranteed that you love me. <laughs> See you in the morning would ensure I didn't die. Now, did, did my parents know that? Of course not. Why? Because they didn't know I had OCD and I didn't know I had OCD and I didn't know that wasn't normal. And so if somebody said, good night, I love you, and then shut the door, I would assume I'd be dead by morning. So I would, ah, you know, dad, 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 what do you want? Say I'm going to see you in the morning. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you didn't say I'll see you in the morning. Say all the things. No, say them all in order. Okay, fine. I'll see you in the morning. Nope, you have to start over. I need you to say the whole thing. I, good night. I love you. See you in the morning. Don't do it out of order. I need the whole thing. Right? So that's a really common one too. Um, asking parents to do something in a certain way. Um, asking parents for or asking loved ones to do different accommodation. So I only use this dish and this spoon. I have my own bathroom. Nobody can use my bathroom. I have to use the clean bathroom. Um, another thing might be um, you have your own special cup. You have your own special plate. You have your own special anything, actually. You get to do things separately. Maybe you get to drive differently. Maybe you get special food that other people don't get. Maybe yours has to be prepared in a certain way. Um, maybe you have to adjust your curtains until they're just right before you go to bed, things of that nature. Uh, just right comes out a lot. Uh, just right OCD in small children. Um, we do also see the more um, more taboo themes also come out in children, and I think people are surprised about that, sometimes shocked, like, whoa, my kid, you know, may have been abused because they have uh, sexually intrusive thoughts. That may or may not be true, um, but it is normal for kids to, uh, and teenagers to have those kind of distressing thoughts. OCD doesn't really care how old you are. It will attack you, and it will attack you usually in a semi-age appropriate way. Um, in that if you are five, you are likely not to get pedophilia OCD um, because you are likely to not understand what that means or that there's even such a thing out there. Um, you are likely not to get something like sexual orientation OCD again. So it really goes based on the level of development. So as you start to get into the older children, you definitely start to see more. You start to see more of the adult themes uh, not that there are adult themes, but the themes that are also common in adults coming out as kids get older. So you might get some <clears throat> harm and sexual orientation and pedophilia and all of those things as you get to be in, more in a school age, you get exposed to more, you hear more, you have more information. And so does your OCD to work with and attack you. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, there are sexual themes for kids that attack even their parents. And that's something to be aware of and to not freak out about because OCD attacks the things we love. And so it's kind of a compliment. That means they must love you uh, because OCD is attacking you. So having in a, inappropriate type thoughts that feel very shameful for kids, it could be, you know, imagining that they're doing something to their parent that's harmful, um, 
whether it be sexual or you know harm in some way good example <clears throat> i went through several months i don't remember how long i just remember it felt like forever when i was a teenager a young young teen i was probably maybe 13 12 something like that and i used to get intrusive thoughts um sometimes my dad would lay on the floor to watch tv and I would have an intrusive thought that if I walked by him, <clears throat> I would very, very likely run up and kick him in the head repeatedly and just explode his head. And then because I focused in on it, because again, I had OCD that was untreated and I wasn't going to walk up to my dad and go, hey, I'm apparently having intrusive thoughts about kicking your head in. Kids don't know that this is what's happening. I didn't know that's what was happening. So I just thought, gosh, I must be going crazy. I must be a bad kid to be imagining, uh, you know, exploding my dad's head, like kicking him. And then it just started growing from there. If he walked in my room, I would look at all the objects in my room and I would be thinking, I'm going to like chuck my, toss my um, uh, alarm clock at his head and I'm going to throw books at his head. I don't know why OCD decided to attack his head probably because it was shiny and bald so it seemed like a good target um but again that's this is these are terrifying things for a kid to go through this is not something that is easy it's not something that kids are necessarily going to understand is not their fault you know i didn't understand why this was happening <clears throat> sometimes there are thoughts about harm toward animals um, i remember having i had a pet snake and we had uh, mice, obviously, to feed the snake. And the, the, the mice had babies. And I remember thinking, well, since I'm already a crazy person that wants to apparently murder my dad, I'm probably also would murder animals. And I'm probably going to kill these baby mice. And then I thought, gosh, see, that's how crazy you are. Now, again, did I ever kick my dad in the head? No, luckily. And no, I didn't kill any mice. But the overwhelming thought that I thought that I wanted to and that I had to and that I was going to and that I must be such a bad person and that I couldn't share it with my family. I didn't want to tell anybody about it because then they would think I was crazy. Um, and so sometimes what happens with kids is you start to notice other things other than OCD, like depression, anxiety, uh, withdrawal, um, isolating themselves from others. So I stopped watching TV with my dad in the living room because all I could think about is any second, I'm gonna get up and kick him in the head. So I just started hanging out in my room with the door shut, hoping he wouldn't come in because then I might throw something at his head. Um, and that didn't seem like a reasonable thing to share with somebody because most people don't know, hey, that must be OCD, no big deal. Um, you know, I thought these were really gonna happen. So you start to get a lot of depression, anxiety, you don't really know what's going on and you go in and you get assessed and you might find out, hey, this depression is actually um, stemming from untreated OCD because it's so hard to live with untreated OCD. Um, and and that is that is really tough. That is really a tough spot to be in. So let's see what we have here. Um, I just had a feeling of attraction and my mind just let it without any reaction. Is this common about ah, sexual orientation OCD? Everything is common with every kind of OCD. So feeling a certain way, not feeling a certain way, having a reaction, not having a reaction. It's really about that OCD is making you question that. This happens a lot for teenagers with sexual orientation, OCD. You know, people are starting to date. People are starting to maybe experiment with certain things. And so a lot of this anxiety comes up and people can start to have it attack that. So it's really important you get a, an accurate assessment and go into treatment with the right treatment provider for what's going on with your child. And the reason is... A lot of times people think they're doing the right thing and they do damage. We, we have had instances of people who, for instance, um, when I was a kid, this happened actually. 
I shared my thoughts uh, with my school counselor um, at one point that I was having about harming um, my family. And I was placed into a mental institution as a danger to others. And what happened is that confirmed that I was indeed a dangerous person. I was indeed capable of doing that to somebody and actually that I needed to be locked up and protected. Uh, I mean, others needed to be protected from me. And that was very damaging. Nobody ever figured out it was OCD. Nobody, it wasn't the right people in the right treatment in the right time. But you can see where those kinds of things can really do damage. We see that with <clears throat> sexual orientation OCD as well. Somebody is having sexual orientation OCD and they go to see a therapist or somebody and they're talking to them and they say, well, I can help you come out as gay. It sounds like you just didn't realize you were gay or straight or whatever it is you were worried about. And I'll help you with that. Again, confirming the very thing that's not true, um, not noticing, uh, being able to tell that it's OCD and not providing the right treatment. And now this person's on a path of the incorrect treatment and actually doing harm to themselves. So that is something to really be aware of. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, how long does HOCD last? So all OCD, great question. How long does any OCD last? All OCD is the same. It, it, it's all coming from the same places in all of our brains, no matter what our themes are, okay? And how long OCD lasts? When you have OCD, you have OCD. It is not curable. It is manageable when you learn the right tools, like we offer here at NoCD, utilizing ERP treatment and helping people learn how to have a, a great life while managing their OCD. That's what I do today. I get triggered every day with some OCD and I live my life in a very happy fashion. Um, and I know that I'm going to have triggers come up and I just keep on going on uh, with my day. So let's see, what else do we have here? Um, uh -huh. So, yes. Yeah, so having a child who um, uses the bathroom and feeling like they have to use the bathroom and not sure and trying to empty their bowels, that is a very common one. I see that question um, in our live uh, stream here. So I will talk a, a little bit about that. A lot of times OCD uh, for children, as well as it can happen for adults as well, is that we focus in on bodily functions. And when I say focus in, I mean hyper-focus in. Um, my children, two out of three of them have OCD. Um, one of them, when he was little, had something where um, he paid too much attention to his saliva and then his swallowing and then his swallowing of his saliva. And next thing you knew, he was just allowing all the saliva to fall out of his mouth because he was just so deeply uh, upset by by focusing on all of this and his shirt would be soaked and the, it, it turned into a whole thing. The other kinds of things people can focus in on is um, your heartbeat. How is my heartbeat? Is you know, breathing, blinking, pretty much any natural function. Um, all of all of those things can become part of OCD for children, adolescents, and adults. Um, the bathroom one, we see that a lot, actually, quite a bit. Um, I have that as well. A lot of themes. The the need, the feel, the sorry. The feeling that you have to go to the bathroom or you're not sure if you have to go to the bathroom. When we talk about OCD, a lot of times we only think about intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts is a major part of OCD, but there are other things that happen in OCD. We have intrusive images, we have intrusive feelings, and we also have intrusive urges and sensations. One of those can be regarding the bathroom. 
I, for instance, since childhood and to this day, every single night when I lay down, I feel physically in my body like my bladder is full. And if I don't get up right now and empty my bladder, I'm going to pee the bed. That's what it feels like. I feel it. It feels just as real. I have all the sensations in all of the places you normally have when your bladder is full. However, I always go to the bathroom before I lay down, making that not possible. I also don't drink a lot of water before I go to bed for the exact same reason. So it's that hyper focus on a on something that then creates this situation and things that can happen. People can get bladder infections. They can get blood in their stool. They can spend hours and hours on the toilet trying to empty themselves out. Um, those are all things I know I certainly had tried uh, sitting long enough. Maybe if, if it all gets out this time, then it won't happen again. And it's it's chasing that feeling of freedom from OCD that you're just not going to get. So it is annoying. Um, what do I do? I lay down and I tell myself, well, you have OCD. That's why it feels that way. Now you'll just have to go to sleep. I don't get up because I already know better because that would be compulsive and it wouldn't help my situation. It would make it worse. And that is also what I recommend that you do with your child who is asking you to stop, uh, stop. I think I have to go to the bathroom or I have to spend a lot of time on the bathroom. Really, really want to make sure that we aren't accommodating that behavior. Take your kid in for some treatment. Oh, I see somebody says, oh my gosh, I have that. I had no clue it was OCD. You know, it's funny you should say that. I didn't know it was OCD either um, for many, many years, even um, until I became an OCD treatment specialist about, mm, I don't know, 17 years ago or so. But yeah, very interesting. We thought that there were bladder problems in our family. Um, there's actually an OCD problem in our family. <laughs> we all have uh, several of us have that particular one. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting little find. Um, adult daughter has a disturbing sexual thoughts that make her suicidal. She avoids getting help. How can I encourage her without taking the situation over? Perfect. Sometimes our kids are adults and they don't want to get help. When you have a child or adolescent, it's a little easier to drag them into things against their will because you still have legal uh, rights over them. I still don't necessarily recommend that. Sometimes I say, you know what, go get help yourself and then see how you can help your kid. But um, certainly I, I can't say I haven't dragged my kids in on an occasion when they didn't want to. When they are adults, there is nothing we can do to force people. But this is what I recommend no matter what age. If you have a child, and they are refusing treatment, and you know that they are suffering with OCD, or you think they are, um, you can do a couple of things. One thing you can do is, if you are in any way accommodating their OCD, you can make it less accommodating and make it uncomfortable. That's really hard to do as a parent when you see your child suffering, or and you just want to make it okay. And you can make it okay for a couple minutes, but we all know that OCD is not going to just say that was enough. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. Thank you for your comfort, mom. I'm not going to be back for more. You know, that's not how it works. We can provide comfort and OCD comes back over and over and over. The gold standard treatment for OCD and the evidence-based, strong, uh, strongly showing um, excellence in outcomes and in faster outcomes and in longer lasting outcomes for OCD treatment is exposure response prevention. There are no other therapies that have the same level of efficacy or ability to work well. And um, that's, that is a fact. So, what to do about, um, you know, how do, how do you stop? How, what do you do for those adult kids? Here's, here's the deal. Just because our kids are adults doesn't mean you're not still accommodating them. I work with college kids who are in their dorm and they still call and text their parents and their parents are providing reassurance. Oh, you're going to be okay. I know you're going to get through this. I know 
don't worry, I'm sending you all the things you asked for. Or I'm doing this thing for you. Um, sometimes we have to let our kids become uncomfortable enough with their own OCD that they want to seek treatment. I myself have two adult children, one teenager left at home. And um, one of my children, my adult children, is currently struggling with OCD that they do not want to have treated again. It used to be um, uh, a little bit more of a mom choice. It's not my choice anymore. And so I said, okay, you don't have to go in for treatment, but if you're ever willing to go, I will help you. I will take care of it. I will help you find the right treatment. You know, I will hook you up with a therapist at no CD. I will cover the cost, whatever I have to do, I will be there for you. So knowing that you're there to support them and not providing those accommodations that make it comfortable. So my kid does not te text message or call me for reassurance because I don't offer it. Even though in my heart as a good mom, I want to, and I want to say, you're going to be okay. You're going to get through this thing. Yeah, I know you will, but you're going to get through that if you go and you commit yourself to more ERP treatment, not if we avoid it. And I, and so I'm just waiting for my kid to become uncomfortable enough that they are willing to go and seek treatment. That's hard. And as a mom, I can tell you there are nights I uh, <clears throat> have to bury my face in a pillow and cry because it is not fun telling your kid I'm not going to be part of comforting you when I know I could. So that is uh, very, very difficult. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Are there any good books for explaining OCD, like a picture book? If not, someone should write one. That is hilarious that you should say that. I am actually in the process of writing a children's OCD book. Um, I have no idea when it will be finished, but um, there are not a ton of them. You could look on Amazon um, and see if there are a couple. I know there, there aren't any like uh, that I know of that are like really, really very specifically, you know, tuned to every type of thing that a kid could ever, could ever have. Um, the International OCD Foundation has uh, on their website some kids resources as well um, where you can go in and there are some smaller, younger children, little cartoons on there where it's like Billy goes to school and Billy and the OCD monster or something like that. And those are uh, little cartoon snippets that help uh, kids kind of understand and explain OCD on a real young kid, like a really young kid. Um, level, um, older kids, you can kind of, you know, explain it a little bit more. Um, all right. So let's see, what else do we have here? Um, what should I do if I still feel anxious guilt, even though I don't do compulsions? That is a great question. And I think it's one of the more difficult parts, uh, when it comes to acceptance as somebody with OCD. We can't control our thoughts. We can't stop our thoughts. We can't stop the discomfort that is caused by OCD, but we can certainly lessen it and help it to become more manageable and not be fearful of it. So a lot of people believe that well-managed OCD means I don't have symptoms anymore, or I'm not bothered when I get an intrusive thought. And it's very important to understand that that is not necessarily how OCD works. I have been doing ERP with myself. Um, in other words, I've been treated um, for, I don't know, maybe 17-ish years, um, 16, 17 years. I still feel discomfort when triggered by something that triggers my OCD. And that is because there is a chemical process that happens in our brains and our bodies. High level explanation of how OCD works. There is a part in your brain that sends out a false alarm. Oh no, oh no, something's wrong, danger, this is bad, you're bad, whatever it is, sends out, sends, uh, sends out a warning. And normally that's a great thing because when you don't have OCD, it sends out warnings when there is really an actual warning and you 
have to be able to respond to this urgent message like, oh my gosh, you know, whatever it is, there's a dog running at you. You should turn around and run. And so we get the, the rush of adrenaline and serotonin. We get all these, we get all these chemicals basically that come down and get us ready to react to the emergency. And that emergency that we are reacting to when it's OCD is a non-emergency. It's not an emergency. It is telling us the wrong thing. It is saying emergency, but there's not an emergency. But unfortunately, the chemical response is the same. The chemical response in our bodies is just like as if there was an emergency. It still goes off to prepare you to, to react to an emergency. And part of the ERP treatment that we go through helps retrain our brain and our body to have less of a reaction. It's not as, as extreme. It's not as intense. It doesn't last as long. It goes away faster. So for example, I gave uh, a few minutes ago talking about, I used to think um, if I walked by my father, I'd kick him in the head if he was on the, on the floor, right? Now, if I had a thought that I was gonna kick my dad in the head and then I got a level of anxiety in my body, well, before, let's say it was a 10 out of 10 on a scale where 10 is the most anxiety and the stress you could ever have. Now it comes up as maybe a two out of 10 and it doesn't bother me because I'm like, yeah, right. I don't kick people in the head. That's dumb, right? I have OCD. It takes me a second to move past it. I just shrug it off. I sit with that little two or three discomfort until it comes down. It comes down in a few minutes and we move past it. That's well-managed OCD. That is what I live a happy life. That's my OCD. Some people can go a whole day, a week, a month, several weeks, you know, where they don't feel uh, those feelings. And that's wonderful for people who are, are lucky uh, enough to have that. Um, I don't know what, what you would call that, a, a less intensive um, OCD baby than, than some other people have. Um, so, oh, these feelings and thoughts have stopped me from doing the things that I preferred. Um, I'm glad that you shared that. And that is something we work with a lot. We talk a lot about living by our values and not our fears and not allowing OCD to take, take the things away from us that we really care about. And because OCD instills fear um, of, of many, many things in our, in, in our lives, we start to avoid them and we start to make other choices. And these aren't the choices that we want. These are the choices where we are reacting to OCD. And that's where you give your you give yourself away, you know, to OCD and allow it to steal from you all of those things. You know, all of the months when I wouldn't sit uh, in the living room and just enjoy time watching TV with my dad because I had to hide in my room in case I, you know, murdered him or something. Um, that's time lost that I can't get back. And now that I know the difference, I don't lose time. If there's something that I want to do and my OCD says, no, nope, that's dangerous. It's bad. You're bad. Stay away, whatever it is. I know that I have OCD, but I also know who I am as a person and I know what I like to do and I'm going to keep doing those things. And the more that I keep doing what I love and not avoiding those things, the better that it's going to get. Okay, so, oh, this is a great question. I, I love this one. Hi, I don't think I would trust ERP. Who's really in control, especially with, so sexual orientation OCD. It's really more of the therapist agenda than the client's or patient's best interest first and only. Whose values? Okay, I really appreciate that you put that out there. I think that a lot of people have those kinds of fears. It's really important to understand what ERP is to be able to understand why it's not something to be afraid of. ERP is not at all based on what a therapist wants to do or what a therapist thinks should be, you know, they would like for themselves or for you. It's about you. At NoCD, what we do is we start with very, very thorough assessments of children, adolescents, adults, whoever comes in the door to us, so that we can understand from you 
because you are the expert into your life. You are the one that lives your life every day. We don't know what's going on in your life until you tell us. And we take in that information and we are able to formulate a treatment plan based on your individual needs. And you are in control of your own treatment. We can't have people doing things that they are not willing to do. We create a treatment plan together with our members and our members control the treatment. I will give you a good example. Um, if I have a member and I say, okay, let's talk about this thing that you're afraid of and let's start to work on it. Tell me, you know, what is the easiest thing that you think that you could do? The easiest that would barely even bother you at all. And they'll tell me what this thing is. You know, that's where we start. That's always our bottom line. We don't start with difficult things. We don't start with things that are scary, that are going to um, drive you away um, or, you know, impress something upon you that, that you're not ready for. That is not how that works. Um, ERP treatment is member or client driven, okay? You are the boss. We are the cheerleaders and the coaches. We are there to kind of help you and cheer you on. I like to think of ERP more as a kind of a, a, a teacher situation. So you come in, we teach you what to do. We help you build tools and put them in your toolbox so that you can leave treatment with a full toolbox that you use yourself in the ways that you found helpful while in treatment with your therapist. That is the same no matter if it's a child or a teenager or an adult. Um, if children come in and they don't want to do a particular thing, they're not going to do it. And we certainly can't make them do it. That's the same with anybody of any age. Um, there's no pressure to do things you're not interested in doing. <clears throat> so even with something like you're um, in this example with sexual orientation OCD, which is something I talk about probably at least five days a week. Um, it's just one of the areas that I specialize in talking about. Um, and a lot of my members have that. So it's, it's really exactly the same. When you do a very thorough assessment and you're a professional who understands the difference between actually fearing for sexual orientation that you're struggling with versus it's OCD making you question it, it's cut and dry. The treatment is a cut and dry day and night difference. And I'm telling you that as somebody who is not only a licensed mental health uh, professional, and OCD specialist of many, many years, but I'm also for many, many years have been a certified sex therapist, specializing in people outside of OCD who truly do suffer from things like, I might need help coming out as something other than I am um, gender wise or um, sexual orientation, uh, sexual desire, sexual preference, all of those different things. So it's really important to realize that there is no crossover um, between those things. It's not dangerous to talk about those things. It's not dangerous to talk about those things with children or adolescents who are struggling with that. We talk about it so that we can talk about it the right way. When I talk to people who have sexual orientation, OCD, that is a very different treatment than me helping somebody come out who's truly struggling with sexual orientation. And the way that we know the difference is excellent assessments. And that's why we spend so much time doing excellent assessments at NoCD so that we know what's going on and we can provide the correct treatment for any age of person coming in for help. I think that's really, really important. And I, I appreciate it. And that's why we're having this Q&A today is because a lot of people are afraid. A lot of people are afraid and we want to make sure that people understand there is absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Um, okay. Somebody says, can we please talk about COVID contamination OCD? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. Because that comes up with children and adolescents and adults and everybody else. Um, so very specifically, contamination OCD, whether it's about COVID or anything else, it's all the same. 
the fear that something somehow that you're going to get something in some way and you're going through a lot of steps to either decontaminate, wash, use excessive means to maybe clean your home, avoid places, maybe you're wearing a thousand masks. Um, I don't know all the different things you might be doing. Um, and that is all very treatable with ERP. Um, contamination OCD is my main theme. I'm not sure why COVID just didn't bother me. It still doesn't bother me. Didn't, didn't latch on to my uh, contamination. Um, or maybe just because I have it so well under control that I can just deal with uh, pandemics now. Um, but yeah, it's something that we, you know, we sit with uncertainty and we, the best thing you can do is to go in, find some, find somebody who can help you with that and to get on a path because the more you feed into it, the worse it gets. Um, I know that I used to spend excessive amounts of time and just be absolutely exhausted um, trying to keep up with my contamination OCD. And it is lovely to get that time back and be able to do things you want to do with your time. And uh, that includes if you're cleaning for your child um, or doing a bunch of extra stuff for your child and their OCD. Um, great question. How do I know if it's just anxiety or OCD? Good news. Um, <laughs> OCD uh, involves anxiety. So they're not separate, right? Um, they can be, you could have say an anxiety disorder that is not OCD. You could have OCD and not an anxiety disorder very specifically and separately. Um, anxiety is part of OCD. How do you know the difference? You get a really good assessment by a professional who can tell you, um, you have one of these, you have both of these. The treatment is very similar. Um, very, very similar. Um, almost not different at all. And we treat anxiety, um, at no CD. So by all means, uh, come on in and find out and we would be happy to help you tell the difference. Even this guy, I heard he knows a thing or two, at least about something. He's an idiot. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. He knows nothing. Ask him nothing. No. Believe nothing that comes from his mouth. You know, my grandmother uh, once said to me something along the lines of, I was like, uh, yeah, well, you know, this is what I do for a living. And, and uh, she was talking about doctors. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor. She said, look, you're not a real doctor. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, mom. <laughs> yeah, grandma. Yeah, thank you. I mean, grandma. grandma. Thank you, grandma. Did you push her over? Uh, no, but I, I never let her forget that statement until the day she died, pretty much. That, that is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she mean. always was like, I didn't mean it that way. That's not what I was saying. <laughs> I meant you can't heart surgery me. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. But boy, it came out the other way. I'll tell you. Well, cool. <laughs> okay. Well, wonderful. Um, let's see. So Tracy, any uh, anything you want to leave us with here or anything? <laughs> <clears throat> I would say... Um, Really just know that no matter how scary it feels, um, no matter how uncomfortable you might feel, no matter how afraid you are for your child, for your teenager, for yourself, for your adult kid, for whoever it is, um, we have a lot of options. Um, we have we have something called No CD 411. You can come in. We've had a couple people talking about having adult kids that they didn't know how to get them help. And one of the things you can do is schedule a no CD 411 call where you can come in by yourself, uh, not come in, but, you know, talk to us uh, via a video and talk to a specialist who can answer your questions about those things and talk to you about what, you know, what options exist out there. Um, but don't let your fear stop you from at least finding out more about it. I was very resistant to get getting ERP treatment once I found out what it was and that I was going to have to face my fears because that sounds really ridiculous. Like, why would I want to do that? Um, and I went into it very slowly and I did one thing at a time. I said, I'm just going to do one thing and see what happens. And so we can do that for you. We can do that for you. We can do that for your child. That is how we work. We don't just have you come in and do a bunch of big, scary things. We have you come in and do things that are very small and not very scary at all. Very, very easy. And we work our way up 
um, to the more difficult things together um, as you become more and more ready to do that. And if you're looking for the motivation, I always tell people the motivation comes from that very first moment when you get a little bit of relief from your OCD or you see your child get a little bit of relief. And then that means you get a little bit of relief. And that's really what motivates you to keep on coming back for more. That's what made me um, do more than just one thing. You know, I started my ERP with fine, I will touch change, dirty, stinky change, which was really stressful for me, actually. Um, and I just dealt with that and just that for a while. And I didn't want to deal with all the other things. And so I didn't. And so my OCD, um, you know, waited for me to come on board with all of the rest of the things. And boy, am I grateful I did. Um, because now I can live. So yeah. All right. Um, I'll answer one more question before I go here. So one of the hardest things about OCD for me has been other people not believing me because I have OCD. How do others deal with this? You know, that's a, that's a great one. Um, people don't actually have to believe you. Let's throw that out there. Number one, I don't necessarily explain to people all the time that I have OCD. Um, I explain it to some people when it seems relevant. Um, what's really important is that you have it and that you can accept it for yourself and that you're self-compassionate. And sometimes we just have to educate people. Sometimes it sounds crazy to people like, yeah, right. You know, if I would have gone to, I think if somebody would have gone to my dad and said, she thinks about kicking your head in. And the reason is she has OCD. He would have been like, you're wrong. That is not true. She must be crazy. She just wants to kick my head in because she's an angry teenager, you know, um, because there's a misunderstanding, you know, about that. And, um, you know, not everyone's going to understand. So I would ask one, who needs to understand? You know, who do you have to have that understands? And if they don't understand, you can always, uh, and you need them to, or you would really like them to, is share information. If you're in therapy, ask them to come to a session or more than one session where your therapist can help you explain what's going on. We do a lot of that here. Talking to loved ones, talking about, hey, yeah, this is a thing. This does happen. There is harm OCD. There is pedophilia OCD. There is all of these things exist. Um, and sometimes it's just a little bit of education. We have a lot of education on our website, a lot of blogs, a lot of different things that are really good to share with family members um, that are informational that talk about all the various subtypes. Sometimes I think hearing it from someone else is helpful instead of us, right? Emailing somebody a little link to something on your subtype, things of that nature. So, well, yeah. Tracy, did you have fun today doing this? Because I enjoyed it thoroughly, I gotta tell you. I am delighted, as always. I love to talk about OCD. <laughs> and I love to talk about how people can get better because I can't believe that there are so many of us still out there suffering when there is a solution that is not really so terrible or difficult and no CD is making it easier to access, so. Tracy, you wanna talk a little bit about um... You want to talk a little bit too about what you're going to be doing at the conference? Sure. Yes. So I will be uh, presenting at the International OCD Foundation Conference. Um, gosh, is that next week? It is next week. Um, woo! And um, I will be presenting on those taboo topics that people um, tend to not like to talk about that I love to talk about. So I will be presenting on sexual content OCD and how it intersects or crosses over into causing problems in people's lives, whether that be sexual functioning, intimate relationship functioning, you know, relationship OCD, all those fun ways that uh, comes out. So that's going we're gonna to be Just give you a nickname of taboo. Ooh, I would love that. Will you make me like a taboo? Tracy, taboo. Tiara. <laughs> <laughs> taboo tiara there you go oh my you heard it right here hold it taboo to tiara it. diamond encrusted <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and i'm the queen of taboo might as well have to throw in some ice into my 
little thing there. Some, yes. Some blank. And that's, there you go. And that's mm -hmm. what we do here. We try and help people feel comfortable talking about those things. We create a safe space for people to talk about those things. Um, we, we offer a lot of things to our members. We offer community support groups for our members um, to come and talk to other people suffering with similar themes. Um, I know I talk to many people every week in my group where, believe it or not, we talk about sexual content. Um, and our NoCD members can come and be around other people who are suffering similar themes and they get into a room with 30 people who have also had sexual orientation OCD, who have also had pedophilia OCD. And suddenly you don't feel so alone. Suddenly you're not feeling so bad anymore. Well, thank you, Tracy. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Have a delightful evening. Don't do tell that. these people lies, okay? <laughs> I'll be over there. All right. You're going to be watching from the background. I will. I'm waiting for my tiara. Yep. Yep. Well, <laughs> it, it might be coming. It might. So. All right. Maybe, maybe not. I'll wait and see. I won't hold my breath, but I'll, you know, maybe. All right. I'll see you then. Catch Have a right. delightful evening, everyone. Will do. Theme song time, everyone. Our friend Paul Melia from Ireland with our theme song for the Wednesday night webinar, which is going to start a little bit early tonight. We'll do a 636 central time start so all right stretch your legs get it out for a minute hit the bio break if you need strap on in we got an hour and a half left to go everybody we'll see you in a minute Bum, 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 bum. What have we done tonight? Ba -da -ba -bum. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. All right, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. Good to have y'all here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the No Sneak Wednesday Night webinar. Starting a little bit early tonight, but really we've been going all day. So that's uh, that's actually quite exciting. We might still have a few uh, guests joining us throughout the evening as well, too. So strap on the feed bag and uh, let's let's just dive in here and see what's going on. So uh, Rainy says, does anyone know if they're leaving this up? You need to go to sleep. Rainy, go to sleep. We're, <laughs> I, I believe these are being recorded like usual. So uh, go right ahead. Um so there's a few things about earworms and music playing. So here's the interesting thing. Let me talk a little bit about that. If you have a song stuck in your head, the very best thing to do is to purposely listen to that song over and over again until you are totally bored with the song. The more you try to get rid of a song in your head, the more it seems to stick. So it's kind of a counterintuitive experience here, but you'll actually do really well in trying to get rid of a song by purposely listening to the song and becoming bored and tired with the song versus attempting to do everything that you can to try to make the song go away. I just have not found that to be very helpful to anybody whatsoever. So give that a go and see if it helps. It's similar to, so uh, some of you have heard me talk about this. I have tinnitus which is a ringing in the ears. So I hear a sound that none of you are hearing right now. And it's due to some inner ear damage uh, for me. I think it was medication induced from back when I was a kid on some early on allergy medicines that seem to have now been discovered to cause that as a side effect, unfortunately. So I will have it for the rest of my life. And I still have allergies too. So stupid. <laughs> um, chewing gum helps i've never i've never heard that <laughs> as as a cure but i would go with first of all listening to that song over and over and over and over again until you're bored with it um but in terms of the tinnitus i can't make it go away i haven't figured out how to make it go away uh, i don't even try to make it go away because i know that there's nothing that i can do for it so it's not about getting the tinnitus to go away 
It's about learning that I can handle having tinnitus, right? So I'm hearing it right now, and it's really loud right now, actually, because, well, frankly, it's it's loud because I'm talking about it. But in a couple of minutes, as we move on to other questions, I will find that uh, it will fade into the background. All right. Ozzy says, I would hate to have to listen to thousands of songs. Well, start with one and uh, see what it does and then kind of go from there. You know, start small and move it up. Jay Jimmy, Jay to Jimmy says, any tips for social anxiety with OCD? I replay social situations for or interactions for days and days after they happen. After they happen, wondering what could have happened differently. Yes, a pretty common kind of OCD where you're just running over things over and over in your head, trying to come up with an answer to some of those types of things. You know, Jay to Jimmy, here's the thing. We'll always leave some kind of social interaction probably thinking could have done something different, could have done something better, could have done, um, you know, something in a greater way than I did. Okay. So, um, yes, we can always learn and things of that nature. We can always try to be better in the future. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, of course. But to review everything that we've ever done and in the OCD world, punish ourselves is usually what it is, right? Uh, and when you say they're wondering what could have happened differently, Usually what that, that kind of means is I should have done something better and I'm going to beat myself up over the fact that I should have done something better than what I did. Right. So recognize this again, we're all probably going to look at things that we did and think, yeah, here's some improvements that I could have done, but do you have to focus on those or can you also take a look at here's what I did really well. Here's what went great. And therefore I'm going to focus on those things first. And I'm going to build upon the stuff that I did really well. And then, then I'm going to take a look at the things that maybe didn't go quite so well. And then I'll come up with one idea about what to improve on it for next time. Not every way that I need to fix it so that next time I have a perfect conversation or interaction with someone, but I'm going to come up with one small thing to do that's different and run it as an experiment and see how it goes. If I do that thing and it turns out well, awesome. I'm going to keep doing that thing. Then, If I change one thing and it turns out worse than before, I've learned what not to do. I learned that I won't be, be doing that thing. So... Okay, <clears throat> that's the way that it's going to go. That's what we're going to do. And make it slow, make it gradual, but recognize that beating yourself up as a way to try to make yourself better is never going to make you better. No one has improved in their social interactions and no one has improved in their OCD by constantly reminding themselves of all the mistakes that they have ever made. You know, that's what OCD lives on, right? OCD loves to tell you all of that stuff and loves to beat you up over those things. Have you noticed that things have gotten better in your life because of that? Or they've probably not gotten better. They've probably gotten worse. They've probably decreased if that's the case. So keep that in mind and recognize that we are going to be here to work together on how can I sit, let me change that, how can I live with the discomfort that I have and can I recognize that I could have done something better? Sure. No problem. I could have done this or I could have done that. That's fine. And now I know for next time I'll try some of these things out. And I'm going to run my life like a scientist. I mean, I hope all of you can really kind of consider this concept of what would it be like to run your life as a scientist and do a little experiment every day. And just, I'm going to try this today. I'm going to change this little thing. I'm going to add this to what I do. I'm going to change this. 
I'm going to see how, how things go when I do this versus yesterday I did this. And if it worked better yesterday doing that, I'm going to stick with that. But if the thing that I do today seems to work better, then I'm going to kind of switch to that. That would be fine. That would be fine. All right. Let me scroll around here a little bit and see what we got and uh, move up and down with some questions. Give me a sec. Can a neuropsych evaluation diagnose OCD intrusive thoughts and tics? <laughs> um, you know, neuropsych can do a full diagnostic of all sorts of things, but they will likely focus more on, uh, you know, if there's any brain damage. I mean, that's typically what people would go to neuropsych for. Uh, and if there's any particular things then that need to be rehabbed brain-wise versus um, you could... I mean, they would be able to look at that and diagnose as well, too. But they probably wouldn't do the treatment as much. You would probably go to an ERP therapist for that. So you might want to consider uh, having an ERP therapist in, in the pocket as well, too, ready to go to help out with those things. Rice Aroni. I like that. Very good. Uh, and I think, yes, it looks like Tracy answered that one about people believing it as well, too. So we'll move on to the next one. Alexander says, one of the wildest experiences for me has been that my ERP, aka my trigger, that I was so scared of because a compulsion a year later, and it felt like I wouldn't recover unless I became comfortable uh, doing my ERP every day, if that makes sense. Um, let me just read that again. So one of your wildest experiences for you has been that your ERP, aka your trigger that I was so scared of, became a compulsion. Okay, so the trigger became a compulsion a year later. All right. So this is one of the things that OCD will try to do. It will pull in other things to become compulsions to get you to hang on to doing OCD. And this is where a really well-trained therapist can help you kind of identify that to make sure that that doesn't happen. So what I would do is I would make sure that you're reaching out to your therapist and you two are working together on this and you're working to really recognize where OCD is trying to hold on and grasp onto and where it's trying to pull into the situation so that ultimately it is not going to be overtaken. OCD treatment isn't going to be overtaken by OCD. OCD does love to try to overtake OCD treatment and it does that as a trick because now if OCD is overtaken OCD treatment, OCD treatment isn't going to work because OCD is going to get in the way of OCD treatment. And then OCD gets to stick around for a while longer, which is ultimately what OCD wants to do is to be able to stick around for a while longer. So just keep that in mind. Beth says you'd like to hear how parents without OCD were able to equip themselves to care for their adult teen children with OCD, especially when OCD rears its ugly head around 18 years old. Beth, one of the things that you could do, of course, is reach out to us here at NoCD for one of our NoCD 411 sessions. We'd be happy to help educate you on that and talk to one of our specialists who can give you some tips. The thing that I think, Beth, you really want to take a look at is how much is your family accommodating the obsessive compulsive disorder? We do know this. We do know that OCD loves to try to bait everybody else in the family into supporting it. So we do know that OCD would like everyone to give the person who has OCD tons of reassurance, assist them with avoidance, do numerous distractions. Why not take a few substances? Oh, and by the way, here's all sorts of compulsions that you can do to feel better as well, too. And those are problems, right? Those are real problems. Because Beth, if you start to be one of the providers of those things for your child, now you too, just like your child, are at the beck and whim and call of OCD. So OCD is going to be like, okay, mom, 
now you need to do this. Tracy spoke a lot about that, about how parents kind of get involved in some of these, these rituals. I remember taking a call one time from a parent who said their child uh, was using one bathroom and the rest of the family couldn't use the other bathroom, but the, no one else in the family could use the bathroom that their child with OCD had. And also that child would forbid any guests from coming into the home because what if those guests had some kind of germ or contaminant on them or something like that? And then there would have to be ritual cleanings of the home. And if anybody attempted to defy the rules of the child with OCD, that child would break things and punch holes in walls and all sorts of things like that. And I said to the mom, so OCD is running your household. You've lost charge. And, and at first she was kind of offended by that statement. She didn't like the fact that I had said that. She said, no, no, it's my house. I'm in charge. I said, okay, well, if that's the case, then just go take your bathroom back and go use it and invite a bunch of people over tonight. And she paused for a little bit. And then she was like, okay, I guess I don't have charge of my household anymore. OCD is now in charge of my home. And I said, yeah, that's exactly right. Now, it didn't mean just go and take charge of the home right away and just start doing things that undermined the OCD rules and everything like that, because we didn't need to throw our daughter into an utter panic, utter panic attack. But what it did mean is, I wanted the family to work all on recognizing how much they were accommodating the OCD and then for them to set up some rules and say, starting next week, here's what we are going to do. And then the week after, here's the limits that we're going to get rid of. And then the week after, we're going to get rid of these limits and so on and so forth. And, and to build a timeline out for this is how over the course of the next six months, we are going to decrease our participation in the rules and regulations that your OCD has set up for the family. Now, was it received great? No, not at all. Is it best to do this in conjunction, conjunction with a therapist? 100%, absolutely, you would want to do that. But we also know this, some kids are going to refuse to absolutely do therapy whatsoever and be like, no, I don't need to do that, that's stupid. Uh, you all just need to give me what I want and everything will be fine or okay. So I didn't want to overwhelm her child, but I did want her to start to gain the home back and not let OCD be in charge of the household. Okay. Lena says, how does ERP work with somatic OCD where you are aware of your bodily processes that are supposed to be unconscious? So this could be things like, I'm aware of my blinking. I'm aware of my breathing. I'm, I'm aware of where my body is in, in kind of its proxemics positions and everything at all times. And most of the time that is kind of unconscious stuff. I mean, I am thinking about my breathing now because I just talked about thinking about my breathing and I'm thinking about my blinking now because I just talked about it too. But again, just like my tinnitus, which just came back now because I said tinnitus, but it already faded and now it's back again. Just like my tinnitus, the thoughts about blinking and breathing are going to fade into the background. So, Lena, the more you try not to think about your breathing and your blinking, the more of the pink elephant experience you're having. So, and we all know that whenever I see pink elephant, I bring my friend, my pink elephant out. Um, if you are going to try not thinking of your breathing and blinking, you are going to think of your breathing and your blinking. It's just the way that it's going to go, right? So what if we did something different? What if you did the opposite? What if I told you, Lena, for the next hour, I just want you to think about blinking your eyes. That's all that I want you to think about. I would bet tons of money, you know, over the course of the next hour, it will be darn near impossible for you to only think about blinking for the next hour. Other things will pop in your head, right? Like, what do I want for dinner? Or where's the dog? Or something like that. And you will discover that in attempting to think about your breathing or your blinking, you will become distracted from your blinking and breathing. But the opposite will also be true. In hoping not to think of your breathing or blinking, all you're going to think about is your breathing and blinking. So our brains work in kind of a mysterious way, right? They really do. 
there's kind of an oxymoronic kind of experience that goes on there where the more I try not to think of something, the more guaranteed I am to think of that thing. And so what I, again, just like the songs and everything as well that we've talked about, I want people to realize I can handle thinking of these things. I can absolutely think about these things and I can handle it. And what I don't want people to do though, is to try to not think about it, right? Because we know that the moment you're attempting to not think of it, that's when it's really going to be a problem. Okay. And OCD is going to be like your annoying little brother in the backseat of the car going, I'm not touching you. 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 Not touching you. Or I see your epidermis, something like that. That's what OCD is going to be like too. Don't think about your breathing. Don't think about your breathing. Hey, did you breathe enough? Are you sure? What if you didn't? Maybe you should think about your breathing some more. But wait, don't think about your breathing. You should be breathing right. Maybe you didn't breathe right. Blah, 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 blah. Don't give in to what the OCD wants. Alex says, honestly, my POCD is feeling less and less like OCD and it's causing too much distress. And Alex, that's where you reach out to a therapist to assist you with that experience, right? When OCD is going from good or fair insight to the level of poor insight where it's harder to now see if it's OCD or not, you really want to make sure that you're working with someone who can help you with that and who can get you on an ERP program to allow you to learn how to live with the intrusive thoughts that you experience, right? That's what you want to do. Don't try to do this all on your own and, and just hope Tomorrow will be the day that it won't bother me so much. Actively go and seek out the treatment that is available to you so that you can get the help that you need. If that's through us at NoCD, fantastic, wonderful. If it's through someone else, that's okay too, right? We, we just want you to not be suffering with obsessive compulsive disorder. And we want you to realize that you can handle these pedophilic OCD thoughts and not have to react to them and feel as if maybe they are not ego dystonic or unliked, but what you're starting to worry about, what if, what if I actually like these or want these, right? Um, and, and maybe these are just me instead of OCD kinds of experience as well too. I mean, OCD also just loves that kind of experience, right? It wants you to think, oh no, wait, this isn't OCD. This is just you. When OCD's gotten you to that point, OCD's really won. I mean, it's really dug in. It's it's sunk that foundation into some darn good bedrock at that point there, if that's the case. Because now what are you going to do all the time? Very simply, you are going to do anything that you possibly can to stay away from any kind of triggers for that thing, which is ultimately the best compulsion that OCD could get anyone to do is just to avoid anything that might be triggering whatsoever, right? the only way to be safe is to avoid any and all triggers at all times. But we know that there's a problem with that. It's hard to live like that. Andriana says, maybe this is a dumb question, but do certain foods make OCD worse? Um, haven't seen that that's the case, but interesting question. So, um, but have not, not seen any research on that whatsoever. Gaga P.O.D. says, sometimes the line blurs on what the right thing to do is. For example, if my OCD notices something in my peripheral vision and makes it a need to look at it, do I look at it once and move on or ignore it? Um, well, I'd like to go down the road of not having to do anything that OCD wants you to do whatsoever. And, and so... What makes it a need is what I would want to think about. Why would you actually have to need to look at something, right? Now, I get that, you know, we all have peripheral vision things, right? But if this is what then OCD is going to take advantage of, we would want to practice in not giving a look for a while in order to learn that, okay, This is OCD. All this time that I haven't looked, nothing's been there. Now, remember this, Gaga. Gaga beauty. 
Will there at times be things in your peripheral vision? Of course. Sure. Absolutely. It's not about that never happening. It's about every time do I need to jump on that and be like, oh my gosh, what is that? I must investigate it. No, because that's what OCD would like you to do. And then when you do it and you feel better and you get some relief, OCD is like, see, that was a good thing, wasn't it? It was a darn good thing that you did that. Hey, guess what? It is the top of the hour, which means it's the normal time that we do Wednesday night webinar. And hence the jump in people that just joined us. So, of course, that means that we got to do a little bit of our favorite, favorite thing in the world. Our Paul Melia theme song. Got to come back on for a bit of our seven o'clock time. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. There's there's an intruder. We have an intruder alert. Intruder alert. Hold on. Hold on. Holy can you, moly. Can you imagine I really was an intruder just like <laughs> crashing in? This is my stream now. <laughs> Take it over. How you doing? I just, I just got a question. Have you really been on here all day? I've been on this for about five hours so far today. So You've already been five hours? I've had, yeah, I've had a few people here and there who have come in and helped out, but uh, it's been fun actually doing this for a lot of the day and joining other folks and everything too. And we've had a bunch of special guests come in as well. I had Katie O'Dunn here earlier, oh, which was just her. awesome that she joined in. We had Jessica here who's one of our our uh, um, people who helps us with uh, some of our support groups. Now we got Chris Tronson, one of my dearest, bestest friends in the whole world. Chris, I cannot wait to see you next week. You're, I am boggled. You're getting a bear hug. I'm just telling you right now. You're getting a bear I, hug. I would love that. I am so <laughs> mentally excited. It's crazy how exciting this is to see you, to see everybody in person. I'm exciting. For I'm starting to question if people even exist. So it, when I see you in person, it'll remind me that you exist. Now, now Chris, I, I learned something today. And, and so that's why I thought about bringing you on here because there was a major announcement today. And... And I want to share that you are now on the board of directors for the International OCD Foundation. So round of applause for Chris Johnson, everyone. Just fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful. Tell Thank us you. about this and, and what's yeah. going on with this, Chris. Yeah, so I've been sitting on it for a while. And I feel like the only person I told was my mom. And I was like, if they find out I told her, they're going to kick me off, right? Um, no, I'm super honored. I mean, as you know, you know, the IOCDF for everyone has been such a central point for people to get treatment. It's been big support of NoCD and you're just really trying to get access to care. And it was the only reason after a year of terrible therapy for myself, um, feeling absolutely giving up because I just thought there was no help. It was how I found um, my therapist. I was able to get me better. And so it's such a full circle moment to now be on a board of director. I'm bringing both my clinical experience and my lived experience and just really making sure that the IOCF continues um, to bring resources, uh, education, community, and um, you know, just the latest in treatment to the people. So I'm gobsmacked and I start next week. My first day is literally the Wednesday before the conference. So um, I hear they pay you a million dollars a year for for being on the board. Too. And a Tesla. And, and a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> that was my requirement. I was like, I want an electric car and a uh, million dollars. And so they were like, yeah, inflation doesn't affect us, no. right? Here you no, go. no. Yeah. They're That's... like, do you need a weekend car and a weekday car yeah. on top of it? So <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Two Tesla. It's like Oprah. You get a Tesla. Oh, wait, and you get another Tesla as well. So my salary won't even get me guacamole at Chipotle, but I'm definitely not doing it for that. So. Yeah, I heard it's zero. So uh, congrats on that anyway. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll put that in the bank. It'll make my bank account not move. But you know what? That's that's not why we do what we do, right? It's, it's to help people out and to make sure people get care. There's so many people struggling with mental health, specifically OCD and related disorders. So I hope that this will continue to, to reduce and to help out. So I'm excited. So thank you. Thank you so much for the, the good words. 
Absolutely. Well, and, you know, uh, just another way to solidify a great relationship between us at NoCD and the IOCDF as well, our friendship uh, and mine and Jeff's and, and everybody else on the staff. We even had Lisa Lawrence here earlier today talking about the conference coming up and all the great stuff that was going to be there. And so it's just been it's been a fun day to have uh, people jumping in and out doing a bunch of stuff. So that's been great. I was going to say, I don't know if Stephen ever told you. So Stephen, when he was first developing the app, we actually spoke together at a USC event um, before like like when no CD was kind of like a brain you know his brainchild and so we spoke together and then when he first created the beta version he came to my treatment center and like had my group tested out so I was there from the OG days man, man before no CD was no CD like we know it today so well you yeah. are actually 78 years old so yes you, <laughs> I mean you look I just great, have amazing but... skincare yeah, amazing amazing good Ama skincare <laughs> That oh, Hollywood wow. light is good on you. I got to tell you. <laughs> this light goes, you're going to see me at the conference and be like, who are you? You sound yeah. like Chris, but you don't look <laughs> like him. It's all the lighting for the live stream. So Wait, I thought you would you would have a person with a boom mic next to you and a person holding a light at you at all times while you're at Just following game. me everywhere, yeah. literally in the bathroom <laughs> when I'm eating. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, Thanks for having one, of the, on. one of the funniest conference discussions i heard was uh after a talk someone was in the men's room and and at the urinal and and i won't give the name away but someone came up to him in the next urinal was like hey i was wondering about your talk i had a question for you and he was <laughs> like maybe we could just finish this first and then we could have the conversation outside. do you recognize that though like some people treat the bathroom and i'm not even saying at the conference but in life some people treat the the, the urinals as like a place to connect with people i'm a very private peer like i want to go in and do it and go and some people want to start like a full-blown conversation love your shit shoes where did you get that and i'm like i'm peeing sir <laughs> so yeah. yeah well that's uh yeah it's great that that we're going to be able to be live and and there and um you know just everyone knows chris has been a, a guest here on this show and i i've been a guest on his show several times we always have an awesome time and so yeah i just figured the day wouldn't be complete without a little bit of chris johnson showing up and just saying hi and a little congrats to you as well any uh Great words of wisdom for our, our folks who've been listening today uh, as well that you want to give them about OCD and maybe the conference and all those kinds of things. Love to love to hear your take. Yeah, you know what? Let me start out by OCD. I mean, I would say with OCD, one of the things that I wish I would have done differently when I was in my treatment is I, tr I treated every thought and feeling as a fact. Like I never even questioned the source of that. So if I was like in a situation, I got a thought and a feeling, I immediately adapted that change. And unfortunately, because it comes from an OCD lens, it was never helpful and it was never healthy. It never expanded my life. It never kept me safe. It never made anything in my life go positive. And so what I wish I would have done back then when I started to know about OCD and understanding it is to take a step back and be like, why am I doing all this? Because there was things that I was doing that no doctor told me to do, no therapist, no expert in the field. And it was just a lot of wasted time. So I've been there. I mean, I could see everybody in the chat. Like, obviously, I've been there where you guys have been. And I get that it feels real. And that's the most maddening part of this, this, this experience. But it's sometimes to take a, just a step back and a breath and say, like, has this been helpful for me? Is my life where I dreamt it would be when I was eight years old? And if the answer is no and everything's falling apart, it's time for us to start challenging the, the things that OCD is asking us to do. Because everybody that I know, like myself, who get, gives into OCD full force, we are isolated, miserable, depressed, not working, not in school, not dating, nothing. So if the treat, if um, compulsions were really the greatest thing on earth, how come we're so miserable doing them? Yeah. And why don't they work? And then why do you have to do them again and again and again and again? If, if, Absolutely. If they work so well, why why not just once and done? Yeah. And why do why do I have to live by a special set of rules that OC has given me that nobody else has had? Why does everybody around me get to do that thing? But I have a special set of rules. So for me, it was like swimming in the ocean was a big, big trigger because, oh, there was an oil spill in the 70s. What if there's still trace of oil? And meanwhile, there's millions of people at Orange County beaches swimming and living their greatest life. But I lived with a different set of rules. I had to be more cautious than them. I had to wipe out swimming in the ocean altogether. And so it's like the more and more you give into OCD, that's one more thing 
you don't get to do that other people do. And that's when you get to a point that you become housebound and isolated because everything could potentially be dangerous. And if you give into it, OCD will definitely make sure you don't do it. Yeah, I know how close you and your mom are. And imagine if you told your mom to live by your OCD rules, I think she would have probably just punched you in the head if that was the case. <laughs> She's going to the conference, so you get to see all five foot of her. Oh, um, nice. I'm, like, I'm six foot, almost six foot and a half, and my mom's five foot. So we look like, you know, stacking stuff. But I'm, you know, I, I would say if there's any um, family members on the stream or anybody watching that is um, like a supporter of somebody with OCD, I think one of the greatest things my mom did in a loving way was make sure that she didn't accommodate my OCD. And I always tell people if my mom would have accommodated, I would have still been living at her house and I would still be um, unwell because there's just no way to get better when somebody is constantly providing the reassurance and the audience to OCD that it wants so badly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're just, you're a great example, Chris, of, of being able to move out of what OCD wants and moving into what you want. And uh, so my congrats is always to you and the work that you've done and the work here in the field and your, your utter openness and honesty about, you know, what you've struggled with and, and what you've come through. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I always want people to know they can get better. I mean, I think what you guys have done at NoCD has expanded the way that people access care. They're getting, you know, supervision through you. So somebody that's been in the field and understands it, um, and accessing care. I, I, I would say another thing to everybody that has an OCD therapist, please, please, please treat the treatment as the most important thing you're doing. I really think that that's part of the reason I got better is OCD treatment was my priority. I had a very clear vision of where my life was going to be once I got the OCD managed. And so I did the work my therapist asked. I was consistent. I was open with my therapist. I was honest. I was brainstorming how to get around certain roadblocks. So the people at NoCD have been trained to specifically work with OCD and the care that they're giving you is good care. It's just, we got to do it, you know? Yeah. So I think that's the big, big important thing too, is when I treated the treatment, like it was the utmost important thing that I could do. That is how I got better. When I see people that kind of treat it like this thing they should do periodically, those are the people that, you know, that are still kind of in it. Awesome. Well, Chris, I know you're just finishing up your day. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but but uh, as always, a pleasure to see you. And uh, again, I'll see you in a week. That'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my last pitch real quick. If anybody cool. can make it out to the conference, it's, it's in Denver. It is next Wednesday, next uh, Friday. But I always say Thursday because like... Well, Thursday cool night Thursday. is kind of the, the pre-festivities, yeah. shall we say. Yes. Yeah, it's literally where uh, Dr. McGrath puts on his other uh, face and he goes on karaoke and he yeah. sings like Luther Vandross. And we're like, <laughs> wait a second, like where'd this voice come from? And he's uh, like, yeah. The, the deep voice. <laughs> yeah, so so Thursday is, is the fun, but it, it starts next Thursday. Um, July 7th, I think is next Thursday. So... If you can make it out to Denver, I know it's costly to fly and everything like that. But I think what's bigger than just the education and resources you'll get there is the community. And I think that that's what I always see in the chats of the NoCD um, live streams. Is so people don't feel alone. They, they connect with you and they connect with each other. So the conference is a way to actually physically meet people that also have OCD. So you know you're not alone. And I think that the support system that you all have at NoCD is the reason why a lot of people don't feel alone. And that encourages people to want to get better. Awesome. We got to grab food or something when I'm out there. We absolutely have to. Yes. Something. <laughs> yes. I like food. So yes, food. I love food. Yeah. I'm, he, I'm all about the food. So uh -huh. people are like, we should grab coffee. And I'm like, but food exists. No, so but, can but we do that? Food, so, and yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Well, I'll see you there. I hope everybody that is on the stream can make it. Um, I think it'd be great for people to connect with people in person. And thanks for having me on today. Eight. Are you really going eight hours? Uh, yeah, we started at noon. Our, our member advocates were on for the first hour. I came on, we've had a few guests come in. I've, I've taken a few little breaks here or there, but uh, it's just been a joy to be here for most of the day with everybody and uh, just chat about OCD. Think my favorite topic. So uh, <laughs> always, always a joy to, to be doing something like this for sure. Well, well, good for you for being able to do it for as many hours. Good for your butt, which is going to be numb when it's done. <laughs> Although I know you have one of those cool gamer chairs where the, you could pretty much live in it and be more comfortable than than any other place so yeah. <laughs> congrats to to the success of this stream um hi gaga pod 
in the chat and have an awesome rest of the hours. And everybody, you are in good hands with Dr. McGrath. So stick around, enjoy, and talk OCD, our favorite subject. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Take care. Thanks again for having me. See ya. Bye. All right, so let's get to a few other Q and A's here for everybody. Um, uh, let's see. Can you touch on how OCD combined with PTSD are most compulsions avoidance? So think of it this way. If you've experienced some kind of a trauma, something very difficult, OCD being the opportunist kind of a jerk that it is, will say, oh, wait a minute. You experienced something very difficult. Well, I'll tell you what. I have a way to make sure that that never happens again. And here's what we'll do. You'll do these compulsions and I'll keep feeding you the obsessions and the obsessions will be themes around the trauma that you had. And I'll keep throwing them in there as intrusive thoughts or images or urges. And then you keep doing these compulsions and that'll neutralize it. And then that'll keep you on your guard at all times to make sure that it doesn't actually ever happen in real life. Doesn't sound fun, right? Not at all. So we want to make sure that we're not giving in to what the OCD wants, right? And uh, excited to announce that no OCD is going to be looking in at uh, trauma treatment coming up soon as well, too. So stay tuned for some announcements around that as we're in some discussions in that area as well, too. So we're really excited about that. A. Ray says, I always have to ask people around me if I committed crimes I envision, and it's maddening both to them and to me. No doubt that it would be um, maddening to yourself and to everyone as well, as, as well too. Uh, again, this goes along with a ton of reassurance, right? Absolutely a ton of reassurance. We want people to confirm with us something. And what do we want them to confirm? We want them to confirm that something didn't happen. Now, there's a problem with this. We don't ever fully 100% believe them that it didn't happen. But we absolutely do need them to tell us that it didn't happen, even though we're not going to fully 100% believe them that it didn't happen. Some of you have heard this story, but I'll repeat it again. Someone I treated once who was watching television and saw that uh, saw a story about a hit and run. And though their car did not match the car described in the hit and run, and though they went outside to look at their car to find damage on their car and found no damage, no blood, no guts, no, no nothing. And though they hadn't actually even driven that day either, right? There was, there was no driving at all that day though none of that had actually occurred, they still called the police on themselves to report themselves as the potential hit and runner person. And the police came to their house. Now, I don't think it's a shock to anyone if I say this, but it turns out the police are not very fond of people calling them, telling them that they might have done a hit and run when they didn't do the hit and run. This, this did not go over very well with the police department. And this person almost got arrested, actually, for making a false report to the police. Now, in this instant, even if they were arrested for that, OCD would likely say, well, at least now you know. Right? So... Yes, it's a minor inconvenience being arrested and having a record and having to go to court and pay a fine and maybe a couple of nights in jail or something like that, you know. But at least, at least you know. At least you know it wasn't you. And isn't that better than anything else? Right? Isn't that better than anything else? And you've got to make some decisions here. And part of that is living with the uncertainty. Now, I saw someone earlier who said it's been a horrible OC day, OCD day, and they were even thinking about doing some cutting behavior, right? And boy, I would hope that that wouldn't happen because here's the deal. 
while you might get some instantaneous gratification from that because you might use it as a distraction from what the OCD is telling you, you're not going to feel better from that tomorrow. All of us have to make a commitment here. All of us have to make a decision. What are we going to do? Are we going to do something to try to feel good now? Or are we going to all work together and pledge to work together on working on overcoming OCD in the long term by going at this for the long haul? Because that's what it takes to challenge OCD is to go after OCD in the long haul, right? And that means I'm okay with being uncomfortable. I'm going to allow this discomfort to be there. And I'm not going to believe what OCD tells me, even though I've got these feelings raging through me right now that tell me, ah, but it's true. It's true. Right. Because we talk about every single week on the show. And I'm going to say it again. We talk about every single week on the show, this notion of how can it not be real if I feel this, right? It feels so real. And what do I say every week? And I'm going to repeat it again. It has to feel real. It absolutely has to feel real. If it didn't feel real, I don't have a job. You don't need me. You don't need no CD. You don't need specialty clinics. You don't need any IOCDF at all. The foundation's done, right? If it didn't feel real, it has to feel real. And the reason it feels real is because OCD is located in that part of your brain where all your emotions are, and it uses them as a pawn to get you to feel the way that you feel so that you will do a compulsion. Because OCD ultimately wants you to do one thing, and that is to do a compulsion. And that's it. Because if you don't do a compulsion, OCD doesn't eat. And OCD gets very cranky when it's hungry. OCD is a hangry disorder. And OCD has an appetite that is insatiable. So OCD is hangry all the time. And OCD is going to be thumping on the inside of your skull, being like, yo, dude, compulse, please, hungry. That's my food. You've taken food away from me. I need a compulsion right now so that I have a little bit of food. Okay. And Moon Team says, does OCD make me a bad person? If it does, then everybody listening to this that has OCD is also a bad person too. It can't be one or the other, right? Uh, Carl, who is one of our advocates, once put on here, uh, he said, this is either the largest gathering of the most awful, horrible, murderous, rapiest, pedophilic people in the entire world, or this is a group of people who have OCD. Thanks, you says, I'm quite ashamed I'm progressing slow in my exposures as it's very hard and it's taking years and years. How do I improve on this? Because I fear the therapist will look down on me and shame me. Well, uh, if you have a therapist that looks down and shames you, you should have a different therapist. Right? I mean, why would anybody want a therapist that's shaming? That doesn't sound fun. The one person to be absolutely, absolutely honest with is your therapist. It's probably the person who is going to be the least judgy person in your entire world. I mean, I, I in 22 years, I haven't heard something where someone said something. And then uh, I was like, oh, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, am I going to judge you now? It's never happened. I'm here to help people learn that they can handle whatever pops in their head, not to judge them about it. It's not like I leave, it's not like I leave sessions, you know, like, Hey, can you just hold on for a minute? I just, I, it's, I'll be right back. And then I run into another room. I'm like, Oh my gosh, guess what? <laughs> Wait till you hear this one. Woohoo! No, that's not the way it goes. It's not what we do. We're not here to shame people whatsoever. Reminder, tonight's brought to you by NoCity. All day has been brought to you by NoCity, actually. NoCity, a downloadable app. You can get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out. It's a free download. And on there, you can hit that therapist button. Now, we've been doing this all day today because we know that with the coming holiday, guess what? It's stressful, right? 
and we know that you may be going out of town. But unfortunately, your brain goes with you when you go out of town, and that means OCD goes with you as well, too. So why not reach out to us tonight? We got openings tomorrow still. We can get you in before you leave on Friday for that vacation. And we can get you set up with a therapist, have that first session and feel like finally there's someone there for me, someone who's listening to me, someone who is okay with what I tell them, someone who is not judging me or shaming me and someone who accepts the fact that I have OCD and this is going to be there to help me to overcome this stupid disorder that I have. That's what we're doing this for. So reach out to us at nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. We have therapists in all 50 states in the U.S. We're also in Canada. We're in the United Kingdom. And we are in Australia as well. Reach out. Let us help. We're there for you. Man, the questions are flying in. I, there's, there's no way I'm going to keep up with all these. I'm so sorry, but I'm going to do my best. Megan Brooks says, Dr. McGrath, you're great. Love your analogies and lighthearted attitude along with your expertise. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for being here, Megan. We really appreciate it. Mark says, why does contamination of an item not fade no matter how many times I touch and use it? It's like it's locked permanently contaminated. Yeah, uh, that's that's an OCD trick there, Mark. Um so, Mark, I have gone to antique shops and bought things. I have no idea, no idea whatsoever, who owned the things that I own. So, therefore, what guarantee do I have that they are contaminated or not contaminated by something? Now, let me give you an example of how the brain plays tricks on people. This is an actual patient I worked with. And they were so afraid. Uh, this was back when I was at the hospital. They were so afraid of the cafeteria because there would be people eating at those tables in the cafeteria. And then there'd be a guy who would come around. And he had a wash rag and he would wipe the table down. But she's like, but then he used that rag on another table. It's as if they're just spreading all the germs from all the tables onto all the other tables. Right? And so she was like, I can't, I can't touch the table in the cafeteria. They're, they're gross. They're disgusting. There's no way. They're just full of germs. Everybody's going to get sick and die who eats in that cafeteria. So I said, do you think you could detect if something touched the table in the cafeteria that it was full of germs? 100%. No doubt about it. So we did an experiment where we went in the cafeteria and I touched one thing in front of her to the table and one th thing uh, was not touch the table. And even getting close to the thing that touched the table, she's like, oh, I could just feel it. I can feel it. It's so it's disgusting. It's awful. It's horrible. Oh my God. It's awful. I said, all right, I'm going to do another experiment. So what I did is I got a stack of, of sticky notes and I took one of a uh, sticky note and I wrote a number on it. And then I put it in an envelope and I sealed the envelope, I licked it, sealed it, wrote us across the seal, everything. So there was no trickery whatsoever in this experience, okay? And it was a security envelope, so you couldn't see through it and tell what I had written or anything. And I think I had actually wrapped that post note in another piece of paper just to make sure or something like that. Then what I did is I lined up 25 sticky notes on a table. After I did that, I had one of my students take the sticky note that I had matches the number that was in the envelope. And I had them go and take that one into the cafeteria and have it touch one of the cafeteria tables. And then I had them bring it back and we stuck it back on, on the table with all the other ones. And then I numbered them one through 25. I didn't want my student to do it. I wouldn't want them touching anything else. I want to no know cross contamination or anything like that whatsoever. So then I had my patient come in the room and I said, okay, one of these has touched the table in the cafeteria. And since you, when you watched me touch somebody in the cafeteria, when you got close to that thing, said you could feel the contamination coming off of it. You could just feel it and that it felt different than the other one that didn't. Here's what I'm going to have you do. I'm going to have you put your hand 
over each one of these sticky notes. Okay. And I want you to tell me just based on the feeling, which one is the one that touched the table in the cafeteria. And so they're like, no problem. Great. Let me, this will be awesome. I can't, I can't wait to watch this. They do it and they pick one. They say, nope, wrong one. Try again. How about this one? Nope, wrong one. Got to be this one. Nope, wrong one. Now, to my great fortune, the very last one they picked was the one that had actually touched the table in the cafeteria. And to prove it, I had my student unseal the envelope and take out the post-it note and show that that was the number that we had chosen to touch the table in the cafeteria. And what this did was prove a point. Contamination does not last forever. You just think it does. Contamination does not transfer in the way that you think it does. And all of this is a relic of obsessive compulsive disorder. Mark, one other example, a buddy of mine who is a professor, he, uh, <laughs> oh, there's Paul Amelia with the theme song again. Look at that. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, <laughs> Paul, uh, one, of, one of my, sorry, Mark, one of my buddies is a professor. To prove this also did an experiment where he brought in, in a baggie, a piece of dog poop that he had collected from his dog that morning. And he bought in, brought in then a box of sharpened pencils. And this box had 20 pencils in it. So what he did is he took pencil number one out of the box and he stuck it inside the baggie and he touched it to the dog poop. And then he took the dog poop and he threw it away. And then he took the second pencil out and he touched the tip of the first pencil to the second pencil. And then he put the first pencil down. Then he took the second pencil and touched it to the tip of the third pencil, put the second pencil. And he kept doing that. And when he got to pencil number 20, he said, okay, now who's willing to touch pencil 20? And not many people were because they said, no, it has dog poop on it. Now, what that means is that the people looking at that believe that that dog poop traveled from the poop itself across 19 pencils to get to pencil number 20. And what they were dealing with was, was microscopically uh, X to the negative 2,000th particle of this. And I don't know why that keeps doing that, so I'm just going to kill it. Um, sorry about that. Everyone. So is that is that the way that it works? Is that how it goes? Because if that's the case, Mark, then my question to you is actually this. What in the world isn't contaminated? Right? What in the world isn't contaminated? I don't know that you'd find much. Maybe out in California where, uh, you know, you've got a couple of places that build satellites and you go through three levels of clean and, and or microchip builders or something like that, that have you wear the suits and the there's the blowers and the, the vacuums and all sorts of things that you go through in order to get in. And, and you know, you got face masks and or the CDC has you wear uh, ultra you know, personal protective wear and, and you breathe through the tubes that go up into the, uh, you know, outside of the room and everything like that. But otherwise, other than those kinds of places, Mark, is there anything in the world that isn't contaminated with probably everything? The difference becomes then, if we see it, we believe it to be that way forever. But OCD does have a bit of out of sight, out of mind, right? 
But once we see it, that's it. It's locked permanently. Why? Because OCD will always say, better safe than sorry. How can I ever get a full guarantee that that isn't actually contaminated? Maybe it's best just to always believe that it is. Hope that helps. A long-winded answer there uh, a bit on, on contamination, but hopefully that that resonates to everybody and you, you kind of get the point of what OCD tries to do. Um, you know, OCD is not out there to, to make you feel great, right? OCD is out there to remind you constantly that something might be dangerous. So I, I hope that, uh, I hope that was helpful. Jan Juni says, what support is necessary to help prevent an OCD relapse? I love to have people do an ERP a day. You know, just, just always do ERP every day. Do something that frightens you. Do something that's uncomfortable and teach yourself that you can handle it, right? That's what we want. Laura says, there's always a poop example. Yes, Laura. How could we get throughout a show without a poop example? Thank you, Laura. For uh, Laura's keeping a tally of the poop examples for the day anyway. So thank you, Laura. Appreciate that. But... Um, I challenge all of you on a daily basis to purposely do something that's uncomfortable and teach yourself that you can handle that, right? You want to overcome OCD? You want to be a great warrior against the OCD? Great. Purposely do things every day that help build up your tolerance to it. Mark says, now he's going to go live contaminated. Yes, Mark. Awesome. Because N says some days they've spent four hours cleaning the bathroom and washing themselves. Not a great way to live it because the rest of us go out without doing that, right? Heck, I'll be 100% honest here. I work from home. I might go two or three days without even taking a shower. It's not like I'm, you know, building up a sweat or anything like that, you know. So I'm sitting here most days and, and then I'll work out at night or something like that. But it might be a two or three days. So uh, maybe... Maybe I'm gross. Maybe it's disgusting. Or you know what? There is also something to think about. And it's a phrase. That phrase is, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if you know what that phrase means, it's kind of gross, actually. Because basically what that phrase means is this. People used to very rarely bathe at all. And so when you did, you filled up the tub, which you might do only, you know, once or twice or three times a year, maybe. And then dad would get in the tub first and then mom and then the oldest down to the youngest child. And every time someone got out, you put one more pot of hot water in there to warm it up again. And then the next person got it. Well, by the time you got to the baby, the water was so dirty. And that's where the phrase comes from, because you might lose the child in the bathwater because the bathwater is so dirty. You don't even see the child in there anymore. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So what were they washing their children? in? All the dirty water that they'd already taken bath. In. Which probably, frankly, still made the child cleaner than it was. But do we need such a focus and a worry about being contaminated? I don't think as much as we put on there. Right. Thanks, you says, does future sight so count as a compulsion? If I can't achieve a future plan, I will feel an instant panic. How do I deal with this? Um, I have no, no problems with making plans for things, but I also know that every plan I make uh, has, a, has a chance of not, not occurring and that the successful people in the world aren't people who make great plans to follow 100%. Successful people in the world are people who have a plan and know how to pivot when necessary. And OCD hates a pivot because OCD says, no, you were supposed to think of a plan that would account for everything. So there would be no need to pivot. So why are you pivoting now? Because you shouldn't need to pivot. And what a horrible planner you are because you didn't anticipate all of the things that you would need to pivot on. So this is bad. This is bad. But it's not, right? It's, it's just kind of, getting through the world. So. We are 20 minutes away from the conclusion of our eight hour marathon here. Woo -hoo! I want to give a shout out again to everyone at NoCD in the background who's been working this today. We've had Brooke, 
We've had Jalissa. We've had Jacob. Uh, just, just great work from the team all day long. And our guests, we had, we had Carrie on earlier. We had Kyle on earlier. And we had Tracy on earlier from those of us at No CD. And I want to thank Jessica and Chris uh, for being here as well, too. And Katie stopped by. It's just, it's just been a great day all along. And, and uh, might have had a few other people earlier in the first hour before I got on. So uh, I think Cassie might have been here, too. If you were here, thank you so much for being a part of this today. Uh, boy, I, let's just do this every every week, huh? Why? Uh, well, maybe not. All right. It is it is a lot, but but boy, it has really been enjoyable, and I think you might see this happen again at a couple of times in the future. Uh, that that will do some things like this, and we'll uh, we'll get some other guests that come in and, and everything as well too. So so that'll just be a blast, and and uh, we'll do this. And a special invite to any of you as well too, right? If you are interested ever in joining me to talk about your experience of getting through obsessive compulsive disorder, please reach out to us at no CD because I would love to have you on and join and be a part of this. You know, some of you are on here weekly and it's always great to see your names and I really appreciate that. So please do feel free to reach out uh, more than happy to have you here on the no CD Wednesday webinar that we do. Uh, no CD downloadable app you get through Google Play or iOS. So check us out. It's a free download. And if you're looking for teletherapy across the United States, Canada, the UK, or Australia, we can assist you with that. You can also go to www.nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. And if you're anywhere else in the world too, feel free to reach out as well. We might have some assistance for you available as well. Dr. Anna says, uh, how is the experience of being an OCD therapist? Well, uh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I, as the chief clinical officer, get to be in charge here of all the therapy side of NoCD and have a great team of clinical leadership folks who make sure that all of our therapists go through a fantastic training program and then have a, a mentoring program that they enter as they're joining NoCD. And we, we you know, observe sessions and we do mock sessions for people so that people really go in with confidence in treating obsessive compulsive disorder. So uh, I would think that you would find that uh, many of our therapists talk about it's a, it's a wonderful place to be to really help people and to learn a specialty as well. Too. Uh, can you talk about moral scrupulosity obsessions? Merci. Well, of course I can, because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. You know, there's, there's always a fear that I'm going to do something morally or ethically wrong and that I might be judged or evaluated by somebody for it. And boy, I would never want anyone to think anything bad about me. So I better make sure that everything I do or say meets this, this just wonderful level of criteria where I could never be judged in a negative way or evaluated in a negative way. And all that I think or do or say comes across great, right? I will never throw away in the trash something that can be recycled. I will always say hello to everyone I pass. I will always give everybody great eye contact no matter what I do. I will make sure even that I wash my hands thoroughly because I wouldn't want anybody to be angry at me that I passed COVID or something on to them. I will stop and pause to assure that all people get across the street appropriately because that's just the right thing to do. I will pick up anything that I see along the way on the street because I wouldn't want anyone to trip on it and then feel bad that it was my fault that later on somebody may have tripped me. And all I needed to do was just do a little something to prevent that thing from happening, right? All these kinds of things where there might be some kind of judgment morally or ethically upon myself, and I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to make sure that that doesn't occur, that there would be no way that anybody could think anything negative about me. I am a big fan of treating moral scrupulosity you know, because we do tiny little things that are, to the person with moral scrupulosity, feel on the edge, right? Uh, if somebody has a name tag on, mispronounce their name when you say hello to them. You know, If you've got a piece of paper and there's a trash bin and a recycle bin, you can even start with tearing a little corner off of the piece of paper and throwing it in the trash and the rest in the recycle bin, but not recycle the entire thing. Ooh, you know, that, that just feels wrong or something like that. But, but 
breaking these molds that we think we have to find ourselves and fit ourselves into or else we will go into the abyss of being an awful or horrible person. Thanks you says, does an OCD therapy require a camera on? It does. My perfection OCD does not let me do this and I'm very uncomfortable with this. Well, then we make that a part of the therapy, right? So you can have the camera on and as long as I can see maybe your ear at first, I can start there and I can build up to that. But I, you know, that is just part of the agreements that we have with the people that we work with uh, in terms of the insurance companies and, and stuff. So we are a video-based therapy here at NoCD, just, just so you know. But we see people who have that fear and we make that a part of the treatment so that people can overcome the fear of that. All right, let's kind of go through and see a few other things. Um, pick a couple of other ones. How do you deal with physical pain as the result of contamination? Do you just sit with it? You have to live with it. I mean, OCD sends a lie to you, which says that, oh, these contaminants are now boring into your skin and they're there. Um, Ariel, I guarantee you if I did this, if I said to you, put a blindfold on and uh, I'm now going to touch something that you are afraid of contamination with and I'm going to touch your hand and then you don't really know if I did it or not. If I told you I did it, you would feel that contamination on you even if I hadn't actually done it, right? It is it is a psychosomatic kind of a thing. It is It is our brain playing tricks on us very, very much our brain playing tricks on us and telling us that it feels something that's not really there. We know that there are not germs boring into your skin, even though it feels as if they are. Now, here's what I want to say. That feeling is real to you, right? I'm, I'm not saying that you're making it up or anything like that. You absolutely feel the discomfort of that experience. But if I blindfolded you and told you that you just touched something that was contaminated, you would also feel that even if you hadn't actually done it, even if I'd replaced it with something that wasn't that thing, you just didn't know it, you would still feel it, which means that it's your brain creating that experience for you. And it's not a result of that contamination. Okay. I hope that that, that, that makes some sense for you there. All right. Let's see. Uh, what do we want to do here? Is OCD curable? You know, I, I don't talk about really the word cure with OCD. What I talk about is that one can learn to live with obsessive compulsive disorder, right? One can learn that having OCD is, can be manageable and it doesn't have to rule your life. That's, that's something that I think is so very important for people to recognize is, is that. So uh, I don't, I don't talk to people about cure because to me, at least from what I've heard people say, cure to many people is the notion that I'll never have an intrusive thought or image or urge again, and I'll never do a compulsion again. I can't make no guarantee to anybody of that. Just like if I treat someone for panic, I wouldn't never say, now guess what? You'll never have a panic attack again. You, know, you could, you could. You may treat someone for a physical illness, but no doctor would say, you'll never have this again, right? Heck, I, I learned recently, you can have your gallbladder out and still have gallstones, even though you don't have a gallbladder anymore. So how the hell that happens? I don't even know, right? Um, I'm not going to tell you that you're never going to have an obsession or a compulsion again. What I am going to try to get across to you, though, is that you can learn how to handle having an obsession and don't need to do a compulsion. So that even if an obsession does pop into your head, it doesn't mean that you're back to square one and you have to start all over again. That's what I want to get across to you. My little brother and I have OCD. One of his fears is falling into the sky. Is that OCD and how can I help him? Our parents are against therapy. You know, I treated someone who had a similar fear. It was kind of an existential OCD experience about what if they kind of floated off the earth one day? You know, what if gravity stopped or something of that nature? Uh, I've had people write a script about that and even record that into a loop tape and listen to it over and over again until they just thought, okay, well, this is kind of ridiculous. Uh, because here's the deal. 
if suddenly gravity stopped and all of us floated off the earth, there would be really nothing that we could do about it anyway. So what are we going to get to thinking about it for hours and hours and hours? What is that thinking about it going to do for us? And, and that's something that I think is kind of interesting for everybody to think about who has OCD. Does more thinking about something actually make anything better? Does more thinking about something actually help anybody? I'm going to bet it probably doesn't. I'm going to bet it probably actually makes things worse instead of better. So why continue to do it over and over again? Well, because that OCD sends us this very interesting message, which says, if you just think about this a little bit more, you'll probably come up with an answer to it. So why not just a little bit more into this? And then we'll figure it out. Now, as I've said before, and I'm happy to say again, no one with OCD has ever thought enough about something to have gotten to a point to have actually figured it out. This is non-figureoutable. And I don't know if that's a word, but it's my word and I like to use it. We're not here to figure this out. We're here to learn that it's okay to have doubt and uncertainty. So you know what, Mads, Madsalyn? Um, I cannot promise that gravity will be here tomorrow even, right? Who knows? Who knows? Right? Maybe we will someday all float off into the sky. But knowing that that could happen isn't going to stop me from doing anything in my life or living my life whatsoever. Now, I don't have OCD, so I can just look at it and go, okay, well, eh, if it happens, I'll, I'll have to figure it out. But when you have OCD, it's like, no, no, you don't wait to figure it out. You figure it out now. Now is when you figure it out. Not later. Not later. No, no, no. Now is when you figure it out. And that's a problem, isn't it? If you have to figure this thing out now, it means suddenly this has become the most important thing in the entire world. I mean, heck with, you know, growing food or producing electricity or harvesting uh, water that's, that's drinkable or anything like that. No, no, no. All that gets put aside because right now all of us have to start considering what if we fall into the sky? That is the most important thing in the entire world to consider. Okay. So, isn't OCD fascinating? Hey, here's all sorts of important things in your life, but you know what? Pay no attention to them. Because right now, we have figured out the most important thing in the world to consider. What if you fall into the sky? And that's going to require a good 7,000 hours of thought before you focus on anything else. So you better get thinking. Okay. I don't know of a much better example of a time waster than obsessive compulsive disorder. Honestly, I, I really, really don't. OCD does love to waste a good bit of time. Okay. Oh, we're getting close, everybody. We're getting close to the end. I hope that everyone's enjoyed the day. I've definitely enjoyed the day for sure. Uh, Chloe says, people say that if you face up to your fears of sexual orientation, OCD, it will get better. But what if it doesn't and they become true and you are just in denial? Well. Notice right here, the what if it doesn't is the what if question, which means that now, instead of attempting therapy, you're going to try to figure out all the ways first OCD doesn't or OCD therapy doesn't work and therefore block doing therapy because what if this one thing would be a possibility, right? What if it doesn't work and it becomes true and you're just in denial? So isn't it better to not do it at all? So I'm going to stay with my OCD then instead, because living in denial would be, um, you know, to discover that I've been living in denial would be horrible. I'd rather just live in uncertainty, right? Because if I discover that I'm living in denial, well, then guess what? That means 
that I really am that thing that I and I've been denying. And I don't want that. So therefore, it's better to maybe not do therapy and just stay in uncertainty the rest of my life than it would be to potentially find out that I might actually be that thing. Now, I can understand that people would think that way, right? But that would be like saying, you know what? I'm never going to drive again because I can't take the risk of running someone over with my car. And so therefore, I'm never going to get in a car ever again. Now, most people go through life without running people over with their car. But some people do. And therefore, I'm not willing to take the risk because I know that some people do run people over with their car. And I don't want me to be one of those people. So I'm just not going to do it in the off chance that I might become somebody that's a runner over of people with my car. And sure, I could get therapy about the fear of what if I would do it and I could learn how to drive and I could learn that I can live with that fear and I can go on and I can do my life. And and even if I were to get in an accident or something, it wouldn't be so bad because I've gone through treatment and everything like that. But nah, no, I can't. I just won't accept the fact that I might be somebody who could run someone over with their car. Now, we see people who stay stuck, right? Heck, there's people who say um, they're afraid to go to therapy because what if they're told they don't have OCD? And that would mean that they are what they're afraid they are. That's what we're talking about here, right? Right. That That is the very thing. So therefore, let me just live in not knowing versus knowing because I'm not, I'm not willing to take the chance to know and find out the answer that I know is not the answer that I want. It's so convoluted in some ways, isn't it? I mean, it's just absolutely so convoluted. Now, I haven't treated anyone in 22 years who's discovered an answer that they didn't want to, to find, but... I also can't give a guarantee to anybody that somebody wouldn't at some point in the future be someone who discovers an answer that they don't want to find. And OCD is kind of like Dumb and Dumber. If you've ever seen the movie Dumb and Dumber, there's a scene in the movie where Jim Carrey is talking to Lauren Holly and says to her, I'd like to go out with you. And she says, the only way I'd date you is if you're the last man on earth. And his response is, so you're telling me I've got a chance nice. And, and that's the way that OCD looks at the world. As long as there's a chance, right? As long as there's a chance. I don't know that it's worth taking. I don't know that it's worth trying to get help going through a diagnosis and you telling me something that I don't want to hear. I'm not willing to take that chance. So instead, I'm going to live in the misery of OCD for the rest of my life because the devil I know is maybe better than the devil I don't know. And I hope over the course of time, listening to these webinars, hearing people who had the exact same fears come on and talk about their life and what they've gone through, how they've survived this, I hope those are the things that slowly and gradually nudge you toward taking that risk getting that diagnostic assessment and learning that you can handle things that you don't think that you can handle. Last one. Can positive thinking affirmations be used alongside OCD without being neutralizing compulsions? Sure. I mean, uh, absolutely. Doesn't mean that they have to be, you know, because they might be about something different than the thing that you're compulsing about. So hundred percent, you could absolutely do that, right? You don't have to have it about the thing that you're compulsing about. You know, you could just say, hey, I'm really proud of myself today for the work that I did. That doesn't have to do anything in terms of your OCD whatsoever. It could just be recognizing that you've done a great job, right? So I don't mind that whatsoever. And I hope that you are positive to yourself 
because you know what? Nobody deserves to be treated the way OCD treats people, especially people with OCD who are typically lovely, wonderful, awesome kinds of people who are going through a really tough time with OCD. Folks, that brings an end to our eight-hour day. It's been a joy. Thank you so much for those of you who have spent the day with us. And this will be up and running so you can go back and watch other parts if you want. Remember, treatmyocd.com or nocd.com if you're looking for help for teletherapy. We are available across the world. So check us out. We've got therapists in the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada. And we do work on BFRBs, so trichotillomania and excoriation or skin picking. We do work on hoarding. We do work on ticks. And we help people with obsessive compulsive disorder, too. And if you're a person who's a friend or a family member, someone with OCD who might not be quite ready for treatment, we also do education sessions. We call them our NoCD 411 sessions. Check us out at www nocd.com or download that app on Google Play or iOS. It's the NoCD app and it's a free one. Hit that therapist button and check us out. You've got a weekend coming up, right? You've got a holiday coming up. OCD is going to travel with you wherever you go. We wanted to do this all day today to really help people be motivated to try therapy. We've still got openings tomorrow before you might be leaving for your vacation. So please give us a call or check us out at nocd.com or again through that app and the therapist button. We've got people standing by to take your call and schedule an appointment with you. All the best, my friends. Be well. And remember, treat yourself better than your OCD treats you because your OCD not doing a great job at being very positive. All the best, everyone. Have a great night. Shut it.